Well, good morning, everybody. And it's good to see everybody. There's a few more faces back in the house of God. That's exciting. Amen. Well, it's a wonderful Sunday morning here at Innisfail, Tabernacle of Yeshua. And I've always made good mention that Tabernacle of Yeshua is really on the cutting edge when it comes to this wonderful feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And God is beginning to unveil a lot of that. And uh, I certainly want to welcome you. I'm Apostle Brian Lampton from Power of the Spirit Ministries in Australia. But it's good to have you with us this morning. So let's just, maybe just read something first and then I'll have a word of prayer. And then we can, you know, we can walk it out together. Revelations chapter 19 and verse 13. It says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. This is speaking about Jesus. And his name is called the Word of God. So Father, we just thank you that this day is a day you've made. It's the day that you desire to unveil to us more and more, to prepare us to be in an honest journey towards coming home to be with you. So Lord, we just thank you now. Let your Holy Spirit continually unveil to us the truth about your word. So we commit ourselves, we submit to your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. Just looking at that scripture there is, is important and I, and I thought we just might uh, touch also on this other verse in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Enter ye into the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many, many there be which go therein. Many are heading down that way. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. And few, right? And few there be that find it. So I suppose if we want to put this in a nutshell, that there is a straight gate, a narrow way back into his presence. And it's all come down to this feast called the Feast of Tabernacles, which is made up of three, you might say, smaller feasts that are part of and one with the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Trumpets, then the Feast of the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles itself. That Feast of Tabernacles itself is speaking mainly about our glorified body. We are the temple of God. And so God's going to transform us Mainly it sits and speaks about that. But it begins with the Feast of Trumpets. Trumpet speaks of the prophetic word, right? And it's amazing how that God has created this Feast of Trumpets, which is separate and different to the other two feasts, which is the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Pentecost, which does have a prophetic uh, sound about it. But it's, it's different when it comes into the Feast of Tabernacles. Because the character and the, the language is different, and I tie those two words together, when we talk about a garment, we're talking about a character. We talk about a character, it has its own language. So the Feast of Passover has its own character, its own language. It's different to that which is of the Feast of Pentecost, which also has its own character, its own garment, its own language. You can superimpose that right over the tabernacle of Moses. The outer court is Passover. The priests actually had a certain type of uh, garment that they wore, which prophetically speaks about a character and a language that's, a t that's tied in with us. So when you come out from the world and you get saved, your language changed because part of your character is now changed. If you go further into God, right, which the priests did, they went into the holy place, they had to take off that first uh, garment, which is that first character, and put on another garment, which meant that it was another language. And we in Pentecost, we know that it's <clears throat> the language of the Spirit, which is speaking in tongues. All the gifts that are associated with is in the character of that feast. So now we're speaking about moving on into the holies of holies, which once again the priest took off that garment and he put on these garments, they call it the whites. That's what they call it, the whites. And he added in once a year, added in, and it was only one day by the way, once a year and on one day, he went into the holies of holies with another garment, which means 
another character that has another language. The Feast of Trumpets was given to us so it can clothe us with this character that has the understanding on how to speak in this, in this language or with this language. And so the Feast of Trumpets was given by God specific and separated from all the other characteristics and character and language of Passover and Pentecost. You've got to get that. You've got to get that in your spirit because when we come over into the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus called it another name. He called it the Kingdom of God. How did, he, how did he call it the Kingdom of God? Well, Jesus said, unless you're born of water, that's Passover, and of the Spirit, that's Pentecost. He said, you can't enter the Kingdom, which we're referring to as also the Tabernacle. In fact, it's the most important feast of all feasts coming into this feast that we are in now, because when Jesus came on the scene, that was the feast he was always speaking about. He said, he went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It wasn't the gospel of the church. It was the gospel of the kingdom, because that's where we're coming to. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? Even in the, um, the parable of the sower, it goes down from you know, the, 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 the hard heart down to the thorny, down, uh, down to the stony, the thorny, and then he comes onto good ground. He said that there might be 100 fold, 30, 60. Order of reference. He starts with 100. In other words, it's the priority of God's heart that we come into this 100 fold. 30, 60, we come into 100 fold. But he mentions it first 100, 60, 30. It's just something to look at as we, as we look at this, this passage. So now I've just read this. Revelations chapter 19 and verse 13. And this is very important that we get this because it's what we've got to be clothed with to go into the straight gate. Right? And we've got to be walking in the understanding of it. So can I say this prophetically or symbolically? Um, that being clothed means that you understand by the Spirit and you walk in the understanding. When you walk in the understanding of what God shows you, you are being clothed with the understanding. Right? So here it says that Jesus, he was clothed. That means he understood what he was doing for a purpose. He did it specific, he did it on purpose. This wasn't, the death of Jesus wasn't an accident. It wasn't something that just happened. Every step that Jesus took and every place where he bled, he bled for a specific reason. And it was tied in to the revelation of the eternal covenant that was inside of him. So we see then that if we've got a character that has a language, then in the character is the covenant. There are words inside and they sit silent until it's released. And the only way it can be released is by the blood. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But he said he was clothed with a vesture. That's the King James Version. Or he was clothed with a garment and it was dipped in blood. In the same verse it says, and his name was called the Word of God. The book of John says that the Word became flesh and dwell among us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God, right? But then it says, that the Word became flesh. So now, Jesus, who was the living Word in the Spirit, became flesh, but he still brought with him the eternal covenant of God set up inside his character, right? But being up in his Spirit was no good for us. There had to be something that God would require for that covenant to speak or to be released. It's all right for Jesus to have that covenant up in his spirit, but there has to be something and something has to be done to release that covenant that makes it accessible for us so we can also walk in the same character and in the same covenant that's inside of him. Amen? So. I just said that there because the word of God was in, in the character and it was clothed. But it's amazing that it says 
it was dipped in blood. And so when I go to Hebrews chapter 9, I read this. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, that's Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 19, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book and the people. That's important to know that. He, he sprinkled both the book and the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament. Now, we know on this side of the cross, it was the blood of the New Testament, which God has enjoined unto you. That's important to know that. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Huh? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. The word remission simply means cancellation of debt. So there's no cancellation of debt without the shedding of blood. That tells me that the cancellation and the law to cancellate, right? That remission and the word to remit is sitting up in the spirit. And it's sitting up in the spirit of Jesus. There is a word in Christ that says, you are free, you are remitted, your debt is canceled, canceled, but it sits silent up in his spirit. But the only way to release it has to be through the blood. So if there's no shedding, no shedding of the blood, then the remission cannot be spoken. But when the blood is released, when the blood is shed, it releases the covenant to speak for us, to have us remitted. And I think that's good news. So Jesus was clothed in a character and all that character was the fullness of the eternal covenant. So the day he shed his blood, then that which was in him spoke and gave us the eternal covenant and the purpose of the eternal covenant speaks to us and we can be clothed with what we hear if we practice and obey what we hear. We become clothed with it. So to come through that straight gate we've got to walk in the understanding of the purpose right the purpose in the context of where his blood was being shed the first time we talked about this and if you want to catch up on the teachings it's all here on the tabernacle of Yeshua Facebook you can catch up all the series come up to this point but we started with the the uh, the first time he, he shed his blood was in the garden of Gethsemane when he sweat great drops of blood. Can I say this, just, just by the way, um, in fact, the first time, that word just first just comes to me, but the first time Jesus shed his blood was when he was circumcised. Now, when Jesus was circumcised, in the spirit, it was a declaration that this boy would become the total fulfillment of what the revelation of circumcision was given for. Now, Abraham received it by revelation. We, we see Moses picking it up and making it a law. And a lot of the Jews had lost the spirit of it and got into the practice of it. But unless you walk the spirit of it, you cannot get the life and the meaning of it. Jesus, when he was circumcised, right? When he was circumcised, it was, a, it was in the spirit, there was a declaration that this is, this is the man that will remove and become the fullness of the circumcision. Meaning this, when Jesus grew up and he went to the cross, when he died, he put a, you might say, he cut off or circumcised the first human species. All of the human, the Adamic species was now removed. When Jesus was on the cross, he represented the last Adam, right? And when he died, in God's mind, because he appointed his son to be the last Adam, when he died, it then circumcised, or was the fulfillment of circumcision, and removed all of the first species. When he rose again, he became the firstborn of the second species, or the second man. That's where we're going to. 
we're going to die to the old and be born into this new creation, this new species, this metamorphosis as we understand the second man when Jesus came up out of the grave. So when he had that circumcision when he was a young boy, it was prophetically declaring that this will become, his death will become the fulfillment of the circumcision, right? That means the total wholeness of the truth of removing it all, the whole flesh, the species. So now we come into where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweats great drops of blood. We spoke about that. The second time he, he uh, uh, shed blood was on his back. We talk about the healing. And then we spent a bit of time around the crown of thorns that was pressed upon him. And the crown of thorns, thorns speak of the curse. And it's the curse around the mind. And if we don't start walking in the spirit, we will always be trapped with the curse of our own mind, our own thinking, the high places of the carnal mind. And that's where the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth speak from. It's their position. And we took a bit of time out that where the kings of the earth spoke. Revelation chapter 16, it says that out of the, uh, the frogs come up out of the mouth of the dragon. It come up out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, right? The false prophet. So <clears throat> let me just put this one in, in, in here as well, that if, if they're all coming up from the same place, like they're coming up at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if they're coming up out of that, the dragon is a spirit, right? It's, it's not a flesh, it's spirit. Therefore, the beast is a spirit. And so too is the false prophet is a spirit and they release their words. And I thought about this, that they, within themselves as entities, have the ability to father their own character by speaking out of themselves a word that would impregnate the church. And therefore, you find that the church is gonna act beastly, speak beastly, it's gonna act like the dragon would act and devour things through words, and also the false prophet, pro false prophetic words will come up out of, out of those that receive this word. The sad thing is, but it's true, it's not something that, um, you know, uh, it's not going to happen, it's recorded as happening, is that those words went into the kings of the earth. And the scripture is clear about that, because it's, and I don't get too, too tied into this, but it says, for they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth, and it says, and of the whole world. When it says of the whole world, it's talking about the whole church. That's all we're talking about. The covenant is for the church. The people that are in the world need to come into the church to be exposed and to receive the eternal covenant of God, right? If they're not in here, then they're not dealt with, spoken to, and they're not refined or, or cleansed if they're not in the church. Here we find this is a direct reference to the kings of the earth meaning earth meaning earthly right carnal soulish and they have been infected by these words that have come into them and they've they've received it they have accepted that these are true words right and then they begin to speak out of themselves we're talking about people we're talking about ministries that are in the earth even today that are speaking words that devour, words that are beastly in its nature, and we talked about that in Revelations 9 on the fifth trumpet, but also the false prophets. These are words that are being spewed out over the pulpit, impregnating the church to believe what is being said is the way Christ is going to come back, right? All this is a contention. This words of war, because that's what it says, it says to uh, the whole world to gather them to, to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So there's a battle of words. That which is coming out of the soul, the carnal words that are coming out of these ministries impregnating the church. And there's going to be a battle against what? Battle against what? Against the true word of God. Against the revelation of his word that's coming also to the church that she would be cleansed of that. That she would be impregnated with a word that would you know, that would eventually become the man-child and all those things that we have spoken about so the contention is the carnal word against the spirit of truth and what is that spirit of truth it's all about the 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 eternal covenant of god that we become sons 
the way we become sons. And if you want to get a little bit more refined in it, it's talking about a battle over Bible interpretation, scripture interpretation, how this word is being interpreted. And unless you are baptized in the Feast of Trumpets, you, you have no understanding, you have no hope to interpret the way he's coming, how, when, where, and why he's going to come. You have got to be immersed in this Feast of Trumpets to get eyes to see it and ears to hear, to understand the Day of Atonement which is how, when, where, and why it's going to be revealed, how it's going to happen. So, you know, we're here today to give some clarity and some words of encouragement to take us through this straight gate. There'll be many who will go the broad way. There'll be few that understand where it's at and we're able to go through. You know, uh, there's a good scripture in uh, Song of Songs. I think it's Song of Songs chapter... I think it's about chapter two, I think, or three. But it talks about, I'll just quickly get it for you. Uh, chapter three, it says, by night on my bed, this is the woman. The Song of Songs is speaking about Solomon and the Shumanite. Solomon speaks about Christ and, and the Shumanite woman is the bride of Christ. And she's lost him. She lost him. And it says, by night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loves. See, there was his bed, my bed, our bed. In this point, it was my bed. So she was making everything according to the way she saw things, but he wasn't there, right? You have to be in his bed, not your bed. It's your way of seeing things, not his way. So it says, by night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I couldn't find him. I will rise now and go about the city and in the streets. That city of the streets is the systems of the church, right? And then he says, and in the broad ways, I was seeking whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him in the broad way, right? Now there is a company of people who know where he is, who know where his bed is. They know where the intimacy is. And that's what Jesus said to these groups of people that came to him that said, Lord, Lord, we have cast out devils in your name. We have prophesied in your name. He said, depart from, from, from me. I never intimately knew you. You didn't know where the bed was. You didn't know how to be walking just with me where I am. You're in the broad way. And there's so much teaching around that, that those who said, Lord, Lord, and we have made mention of this so many times, but they are the people of Passover and Pentecost. Lord of Passover, Lord of Pentecost, but they never knew him as Lord of this most important feast, the Day of Atonement, because they don't know the way in. Mm. So, we've seen, I just wanted to give that context that Revelations 19 speak about that he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, right? And that's where we're going. When Jesus bled in the garden, and they took him away and he bled on his back, on, his, on the crown of thorns, on his right hand, his left hand, his feet and his side. Every place that he shed blood, right, speaks of the covenant for us to know and walk in and be clothed in to go into the straight gate, right? It's not all over the place. Yes, we know there's a general salvation. Yes, we know it's generally redeemed. Yes, we know all those truths about that. But when it comes to the straight gate in the Day of Atonement, there's a specific message that we've got to understand to be clothed with the vesture dipped in blood. And that's where we're going, because that's the only way we're going to get back home. All right. So eschatology, meaning the end things or study or a teaching on things that are at the end. All right. That's all that really means. But let me just read again what I've just read because I want to get into the next session. We've done the bleeding from the, the face and then we've done the back, the crown of thorns. Today I want to speak about the right hand. Jesus was nailed to the cross and blood came from his right hand. What does the right hand say? What is the voice of the blood speaking when he was pierced in the right hand? All right. Well, let me just say this first. Everything understood and taught in eschatology must be brought across and be interpreted in the light of the Feast of Tabernacles. 
But I want to put this down in your spirit. I want to say it and put it in your spirit. It's important to remember that all scriptural interpretation of eschatology, and that's, that's the Feast of Tabernacles, right? The end times is not in Passover or Pentecost. Everything is relegated under the Feast of Tabernacles. Everything about his return is relegated to that feast. And unless you understand this feast in, by the merits and by the language that it's given, you won't interpret it correctly. You can't stand in Pentecost with a prophetic mind trying to interpret something about eschatology, which is what the kings of the earth continue to do, right? And then they begin to look for external signs. And I say it like this, external signs versus internal discernment. That's where we're sitting at this feast. We're looking on the inside. When you get into the Feast of Trumpets, God gives you x-ray vision about how your soul functions and about how your spirit man functions because this has all to do with inner change. It always has. Passover, I was born again inside. Pentecost, I was baptized in the spirit inside. Guess what? Tabernacles hasn't moved. It is now manifesting inside. And I need to know that change is happening here. Don't look through the outward signs. There's no signs out there. There's no signs to look for out there when it comes to eschatology, when it comes to the end times. <clears throat> there may have been some external prophetic words in the Feast of Trumpets, and there was. You know, you'll become this, and God saw that, and I felt this, and the Lord wants me to say that you're going to get this money, and you're going to get this job, you're going to get a good car, you're going to be blessed. All those things are true and may have been true back in Pentecost. That's got nothing to do with coming into this feast. It has all to do with character change. It's personal, it's internal, and it's incredibly intimate. You've got to hear his voice yourself. Get your oil, get your understanding, because that's the straight gate. There's only one gate, it's Jesus, and you have got to hear him for yourself. And so that's what's important. You know, you can't just say, oh, you know, Lord, I was part of power of the spirit, you know, and I, I used to attend the meetings there and I heard what you said. You know, I agreed with that. That's not going to cut it either. You've got to get it in yourself and begin wearing it and walking it. All right. Unless you practice it, you are in the feast still naked. Because when the, the, the guy turned up at the wedding and there was a guy there, with, he was naked. He said he had a cloth over him. But he was naked. He was called as being naked. In other words, he had all the teachings. He, had, he was there with all the meetings and he had all the stuff on, but he never walked in it. Therefore, he was sitting there naked with all the teaching. You can sit there and say, yeah, I was there with the teachings, but did you practice it? No, you're naked, brother. Go and put some clothes on. Go and practice what you heard. That's the only way you're going to come into this. And so got a little bit carried away there, but I just want to say that we've got to come into what God is saying. So it's important to remember that all scriptural interpretation of eschatology are written in parables. The Feast of the Day of Atonement is the feast where the manifestation of Christ will appear. And when the manifestation of the sons of God, it's where the manifestation of the sons of God will also appear and take their place. The primary purpose of the Feast of Trumpets is to unveil all truths relating to the Day of Atonement, which is also known as the Day of the Lord, the Day of Christ. And most often through Scripture where it mentions the Day of something or the Day of the Lord, it's mostly talking about the Day of Atonement. The purpose of this teaching is to make known to the people that this hour, God hides, hides, the revelation knowledge of how he will return and how it's written and how it will be revealed in and through parables. Mm. In and through parables. These parables are the natural illustrations and descriptions of the characteristics and the function of the spiritual laws and the solicial laws. Right? They operate in those areas which which operate primarily, as I said, within the believer. Now, there are, are teachings and explanations of spirits that are outside of us, and we know their function, and that's fair enough to say that's where you go with, with it being ex external. But as for the change, and as it will go down and operate in you, 
You have to see it as something happening internal. Amen? So there is an end time people in the earth now. There's an end time people in the, church, in, in the earth now, today, who are beginning to walk in the understanding and more importantly, how to activate these spiritual laws and these celestial laws which will usher in the kingdom of God in all its fullness. That's what's going to happen. The scripture teaches there was only one purpose, obviously coming from one eternal covenant, you know, that God ever had for humanity, and that was he wanted sons who would, uh, who, he wanted sons who would have the father's mature character and whom he could express himself through forever. So he wants to express himself through these sons, but also you can see and run it parallel to this that he wanted Jesus to have, to increase that same love, the same anointing, the same fragrance, but in many. And he found a way to do that. If ever there was a way to increase the love from his own son, he created other sons that have equal character to express the fragrance, the love, the obedience that flows through his own son, but it's multiplied. I don't know. God found it, found a way to do it. So this, this was completed. The maturity of becoming a son was completed in Christ, right? It was completed in Christ in relation to his divine and mature character. And guess what? it will be fulfilled in a company of people within us. Hallelujah. So, just want to say this last little bit here. I think I've already said it in, 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 in somehow, some principle, but Jesus fulfilled the end times when he rose from the grave. Jesus is the completion of the character as a mature son, and it's been imputed to us if we are there to receive it with understanding. All right, one more little thing I wanted to say and then I'll get into the right hand. Before we can begin, I wanted to say these three things must be established in Bible interpretation. First, scripture must interpret scripture. So important. It's, it's, it's always a mistake. It's an error in Bible interpretation when you see circumstances happening and you go back to the word of God and try and fit a scripture to suit those circumstances. To me, that's so loose in, in, in Bible interpretation when it comes to the end times. You've got to watch the spirit of the word. The word will interpret the word, right? The, the word must interpret the word. I would rather keep my eye and know the spirit of the word than looking at circumstances that are happening in different ways and different things. When I grew up in the 70s, I, I, I would hear the end time preachers and they still preach these, on these same principles. And, uh, and now that the world is changing, their message is changing. And now different countries are ri rising up. They'll put those countries in play as back in the 70s, it wasn't those countries. And it just seems that I can look back and look now and say, these same prophets are preaching the same sort of things, looking to the circumstances, and somehow, because the circumstances change, they're making the word of God change according to the circumstances. It doesn't work like that. Scripture must interpret scripture. There's only going to come one way, and the word will tell us how it's going to come. Secondly, all end time events, right, must be interpreted through the prophetic eyes and ears of the feast of trumpets. How many times have I said that? We've got to look at that. We're all saying that in this move, right? We've got to have eyes to see, ears to hear. And number three, it's internal. It's internal. This teaching is, it'll always go back to looking inside of ourselves. As I said, outward circumstances versus inward discernment. That's where we're going, inside ourselves. If we don't get right inside, it doesn't matter what's going on outside. You've got to know what's going on inside of you. So there's just some three little basic principles that I just wanted to say as we come into uh, reading the Word of God. John 20:20. 20, 20, uh, if we got there, is this the record of where Jesus was crucified? And it's just to mark mark off. It says that, and when he had so said, 
he showed unto them his hands and his side and the disciples was glad when they saw the Lord so he was pierced and we, when we know that to be crucified is to be pierced in the hand in both hands but it is significant during this day of atonement that we look at the right hand what significance is there about the right hand well we know it speaks of authority but more so it speaks about the word itself the left hand is the spirit the right hand is the word and so when they come together it's the spirit and the word and when you see it, it's prophetic that when we clap we are we, we are you know like lift up your hands to the lord it's a prophetic gesture you know when we lift our hands up it's the spirit and the word it becomes the banner over the enemy if we know that if we know that, if we understand it, when I lift my hands up, then there is the spirit and the word we are declaring to the enemy that this is the banner by which we live and we are covered by it. Psalm 16, 11 says, at thy right hand, right? There are pleasures forevermore. It's the character of authority. Revelation chapter one, why not? Revelation chapter one, let's get down to it. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16. And I'm taking this as a subject, the right hand. There's other places where it speaks about the right hand, but I'm saying it because it's in the context of the Day of Atonement. Okay? That's what, what, what makes the difference. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars right he had it in his right hand seven stars verse 20 says the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches right so the seven angels of these seven churches are these stars now the word angel is angelos and it means it just simply means a messenger and you can only be a messenger if you carry a message and so God is going to raise up messengers or a word that will cleanse his church now to cleanse his church has to be a word of authority once again the right hand when Jesus bled from the right hand it gave voice power strength to the word that was in his right hand or the meaning of that word which is with authority was to be released and to speak into the church to cleanse the church so there's a word that's coming after the church to cleanse her now to cleanse her you have to deal with what's in the soul the suke is the church but you know, in the core of, and I might put, I'll well, leave it there, but in the core of the soul, right, this is the church, the suke, the womb, or the church, but inside there is where this word is going to go. The authority of this word is, is directed to deal with this man of sin, the beastly nature, this area that is operating and controlling. She is sitting on this beastly nature, right? As it says in Revelation 17, she is sitting on him and therefore this word that's coming with authority is going to purge or, or should i say we purge the man of sin but clean the woman there's two separate things there one is to purge that will then give the washing if we can see that of the church see the church the woman didn't go to the cross the man went to the cross and jesus went there and dealt with the head he dealt with the man of sin. He dealt with the beastly character and everything that was wrapped up in that character. Let me put it this way. The fullness of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil sits in us. You say, how did that happen, Pastor? When you go back to Genesis, you find that when they received the seed word and that's all that, that's all that it took was a seed word from the, that entity, the devil, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's an entity. And he had a language. And when he spoke, Adam and Eve, when they received it, they received everything, everything 
in the, in the character and the nature of that tree and it went into them, right? For example, in the natural, I saw a beautiful tree, a willow, a weeping willow, and I wanted that weeping willow. So to get a seed, when it comes out in bloom, you take a little seed off. In that seed is exactly everything that's in that big tree. That big tree, this seed is the, is the perfect seed that would make that tree, it's in that seed. The DNA is the same. All the characteristics, and, and it might be different in a shape, but the, the life and character of that tree is in this seed. Now I can take that and plant that. Guess what? It'll come up exactly like that one there because that was the daddy tree. This is the little baby tree that's now grown up. This father of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, stay away from him. Why stay away from him? Because this tree had the ability to father himself. He could speak out of himself and put his own character inside. And that's what he did. He put his seed. That's all it took was his own seed. And inside of us is everything that's demonic. Everything from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil sits in the core of our soul. So it takes a word on fire to come and purge the man of sin that is full blown in its character inside of me. And that takes the authority of God's word. So when Jesus bled, that blood released the covenant that then burned and purged the man of sin out of me. <coughs> Excuse me. Go to Revelations, uh, sorry, Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. I'll just break it down just a little bit. I'm saying things, but I just need to break down the spirit of it in the word. Ephesians chapter 5, 23. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave himself for the church. When did Jesus give himself for the church? When he died, right? When he was crucified, he was on his way to giving, right? He bled in the garden, he bled on his back, a crown of thorns, he's up on the cross, he's still bleeding, he's still alive. He's on his way, the day or the moment the moment he dropped his head and he died, right, the church got clean. Because now the man of sin that sits inside, the cross was applied to the core of our soul. This noose, this mind, this character was now dealt with. It says that he gave himself for it, gave himself for it, <clears throat> that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Right? So the washing of the water by the word does not happen until the man of sin is dealt with. When, he, when he's dealt with, she is cleansed. Not only is she cleansed, according to Romans chapter 7, she is now clean and innocent. She is now a virgin. And now her marriage to this man of sin, to this character, has now been severed or it stopped because he's now dead, which makes her legally free to marry another. And that's the bridegroom that's coming, the mind of Christ, the character, another character that's coming. Amen. The good thing about this fire of this word, and I think we've been talking about it a little bit in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, which says that, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, and then the wicked, wicked one will be revealed when the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So one, the, the law of sin and death will be consumed. This is a character that sits in there. Sin and death sits in us, right? But this consuming fire of the word is going to purge out this man of sin, right? It's going to purge it out so that the law of sin and the law of death will be dealt with by this word. Because it says here, it will consume the spirit of it will consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's the law of the law of sin, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's death. So when the actual manifestation comes, death will be removed forever as well. Oh, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this later. I want to talk about something later about death. Ha! Hey, I'll leave it till another time. But he says here, 
that it, it's consumed. So this word of the fire from this hand, its purpose is specific and it's tailored to purge this man of sin in the church. So when we go through this this morning, you'll see everywhere it says to the overcomer, to the overcomer. The overcomer is, is those that understand the purging that will overcome and purge out this man of sin. The, the, the blessing or the, the consequence or the, the outworking of this dealing with this man of sin is that the church gets washed, right? She just watched the harlotries fall away because the full circumcision has removed the character the abuser has gone now it's an automatic thing a process of time that she is now washed the soul the suke the womb is now cleansed and it goes back to its innocent its virgin state again that's how god does it it's laws and principles within us so we have to know that the angels of the church the seven words the seven messengers have a specific task when the blood was released it spoke directly and I want to tell you it was on fire when it came and we'll have a look at what the overcomers were dressed in <laughs> oh what were they dressed in they were dressed in fire but there's stuff that's going on in them as well so the, the fire has two processes it goes in and it purges and guess what else the fire remains Whoo! Zeal. Fire. His ministers have become a flame of fire. It not only purged, but it remains on fire. And you can't put that fire out. And that's the nature and the character of this word. You can't put it out. But unless Jesus had his own body pierced, then the fire of that covenant would have remained in him. But because he went to the cross, did two things. It released the covenant to speak and the blood earthed it. The blood earthed it. That means it's no good sitting in the spirit. Only the blood can take it from the spirit world, the eternal covenant, and bring it down and make it available to me. If it sits in the spirit only, it can't move. But I want to tell you, it's in my spirit now. And because of what Jesus did, now there's a feast that's going to open up for me to understand. And when I understand, I start walking at it. And when I start walking in what I understand, guess what? I download the fire from my spirit down to the core of my soul. And that man of sin is purged, which washes the woman. Amen. Good news. That's good news. Okay, so we're looking at this the church here now it goes on to say in chapter 2 about the church of Ephesus now what I want to talk about as I just said um, I just want to walk this out because this is where the word is in me is, is settling that Revelation 16 and Revelations uh, sorry Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 and 20 it speaks about the character of the authority that's inscribed in the right hand of Jesus right and as i've said the moment they punctured his right hand it released the language of the blood to speak through the seven angels or the seven messengers or the seven messages right to the churches to be cleansed the blood gave the rights to the seven stars to voice to speak the language of the eternal covenant and you know what they dealt with here not only in us because we're part of that world, you know, the whole world, Revelation 16, but it also deals with what the kings of the earth are confirming and, and, and putting in and trying to impregnate the church. It purges it out. And thank the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. The kings of the earth. And that's where the battle is taking place. To him that overcomes, right? I'll give him all these, all these things. So the blood earths the eternal covenant into the core of my soul. Praise the Lord for that. So, <clears throat> what we want to deal with just very quickly is some of the blessings that have come out because the overcomer has overcome the character that's on the inside that gets his, his womb, his church cleansed 
for that marriage. Amen. So, let me just go into this. All right. <clears throat> I'm just going to read this uh, through the word, and let's just go through it, and I'll just talk as I feel it come to me. But Revelation chapter 2, and uh, looking at the church of Ephesus, when we go down to verse 7, it says, To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life. Jesus is that tree of life. And the fruit of that tree is the fruit of the eternal covenant. And to the overcomer, he's able to eat the fruit of that eternal covenant, which is to become a son. He shall eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst. In the midst is in, in the place of governance of the paradise of God. That paradise of God is that bosom. It's up there in that invisible realm. And while I'm thinking about it, let me just establish just quickly that eternal realm is, is the third dimension, right? All that area up there is heaven, the spirit world. Satan doesn't go up in the spirit world. He hasn't got the character to make the transition. So he is stuck and he is limited to the second dimension. He, he might, the only time he gets a visit from the third dimension is when the Lord turns up to rebuke him or deal with him or tell him what he should do. That's all that's going on down here with him. He cannot ascend and he'll never go up. That's, that's just how it works, right? But up, even up in this third dimension, which is called heaven, there is an invisible realm in the third dimension. In the spirit world, there's an invisible realm in the third dimension. How about that in God? Whoa! Come on. So, Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter ten says this, verse fourteen. He says, "Behold the heaven, which is this area here. Behold the heaven, and the heaven of heaven, right? The heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God." Amen. So there's a heaven in the heaven. Get that. So that's that, but that's where. The sons go to. We go up into the invisible realm. Everything we will read now that's a promise to the overcomer, right, is all residing up in that invisible realm. It's not just hanging around in the third heaven. It's up in his bosom. It's up into that realm of intimacy. It's up in the paradise. It's up in the core, the function, the governance, the character that's inside. It's invisible. And that's where we're going. So he says here, to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden. To the church of Smyrna, he says here in verse 11, he that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death. Well, there was a word in verse 10 too. He says, I'll give thee a crown of life. See, the crown of life is the mind of Christ. When you get the crown of life, that's, you, you have received the character of the mind of Christ. That means you rule and reign, and you think as he thinks. And whatever passes from the Father passes through the mind of Christ, which is in you. Oh, glory. But he says that he that overcomes, verse 11, shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, the first death is our physical death, right? We die. Some will die physically, right? But the second death is... Those Christians, right, that will not ascend up into this dimension. Now, the second death, death meaning separation. That's all that death means. It means to be separated. And if you're being separated from this character of sin and death, then you have died to it, and you are now sanctioned and separated unto, unto life. Right? There's a separation. So the second death will not touch us. In other words... We will not be on this side where the Christians miss out on their inheritance and then they die to the inheritance. Whereas we will not die to our inheritance. We walk with it. We become one with it. We're not suffering the second separation. First separation is we leave this body. And if you don't get into sonship, you're going to suffer the second death or the second separation, which is a separation from the inheritance. But to the overcomer, he steps into the inheritance. There's no second death. 
Thank you, Lord. All right. So the church in Pergamos, he says here in verse 17, to whom that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna. <laughs> the hidden manna, people. Hallelujah. What does that mean, Pastor Brian? Well, let's have a talk about it. Uh, Revelation, uh, uh, second, second Corinthians. Every time I say, say a book, I say Revelation first. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says this. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, verse 2. Whether in the body I cannot tell or out of the body I cannot tell. God, only God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So he's caught up into the third heaven, right? And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, and the Lord knows, how that he was caught up into paradise. So not only the third heaven, now he's been a bit more specific. He's gone up into paradise. He's gone up into this invisible realm. And he said, and I heard. That's all he did. I heard. I heard unspeakable words. Or words unspeakable means words he heard that were not to be spoken. They weren't said. They weren't said yet. He heard it, but he wasn't permitted to speak it. And can I say to you, there's no carnal man that will ever hear, let alone speak it. But he heard it. I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. A carnal man, a man of the first, you know, the man of this first species, do not have the legal rights or the character to speak what he heard. So he got up there and he heard this hidden word. What hidden word? The hidden manna that was in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the man-child, but there are words in the man-child that sits in there yet to be spoken by the man-child. And can I say, the man-child is full of eternal words that are yet to be spoken. And can I say, because he got caught up in the third heaven and he heard unspeakable words yet to be spoken. People of God. <laughs> People of God. When the sons of God go up into this bosom, up into this invisible realm, they are the only ones that will hear. They are the only ones that will speak. And they are the only ones that can converse and fellowship at that level in the invisible realm. And no one else lower than that will ever communicate or know what has been heard or said among them. It's invisible. And they sit up in that realm. They speak with God face to face. And they come out with the instructions. But it's only them that speak it and hear it. It's invisible. It's unheard. They can't speak or hear it because it's only given to the sons this invisible language that's coming out of God's heart. I got excited about that when I heard that. You know, I said, Woo, Lord. But you see, it says they eat the hidden manna. To eat means to put the character in. And if you got the character, you're going to speak what the hidden manna was destined to speak. They don't speak Logos, and they don't speak Rima. If it needed be, it, they will. But they're on about oracles. And oracles are not so much something prophetic. Oracles, when they speak, it happens then. It happens then. Devil go back to the pit. He's got to go now. You know, oh, when can I go? Have you come to torment us? You go now. You go now. Because the oracle has come. Oracle doesn't have any prophetic time about it. It's now. I say it, you go. That's the nature and character of this word. All right. He says, and I will give him a white stone. A white stone. This word white. See, when you come over into the tabernacles and you, and you read anything that's to do with white, it means transparent, right? But it's more invisible. That's where you're sitting. So the only word they use mo most times is white, which means invisible stone. Now that word stone, you know, the book of Peter says, we are living stones. To the overcomer, he's given this invisible white, this invisible stone. Now, there's a lot of teachings around the stone. It's a stone of acquittal. It's a stone of voting. It's a stone of this. But there is a word that sits in there and it talks about the stone being a voice, right? It's a voice. It's an invisible voice. No one else can hear it. 
only you and the Father. When the Father speaks to you, you are the only one that hear his voice. It's specific, it's personal, it's intimate. Even though another son is standing beside you, he cannot hear what the Father said to you. It's personal. Because that's what it says there. It says that the new stone written which no new and a new name written which no man knows, saving he that receives it. So when the Father speaks to you in this invisible realm, you're the only one that hears it. And guess what? When you speak back to the Father, you're the only one that he hears. And no else hears what you're saying oh glory glory what a special place we have in him a white stone it's a voice a transparent an invisible voice if I could use that word invisible voice it means that it cannot be heard it's a new name or a new character written a new character written means a new character inscribed in you a new character imprinted in you to say tattooed is not a real strong word, although they use it sometimes to be tattooed in you. Or rather the word inscribe. It means his character is now in your character. And it's going to be expressed. You know, we say face to face is more interface. His face coming up through my face. It's not me on this side and I'm looking at him face to face. No, interface. He's coming up and it's his projection of his character and face is coming out of me. And they say, hey, He's a son, because we can see the, we can see his father. We know he's a, we know he's from God. We know he's the son of God because we can see the father's face. He looks like his dad. Whoa! So that's to, to to overcome in the church of Pergamos, the church of Thyatira. In verse 26, now there's a lot of stuff that we can teach, and I've got all that teaching, but the, we don't want to go through that. We're just looking at the overcomer. Right, Verse 26, the overcomer for the church of Thyatira, it says, He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Power over the nations. Now remember at the beginning of our message I said, it's internal. It's not external. We're not talking about the nations out there. Oh, what do you mean, Pastor Brian? And we're talking about nations on the inside. Well, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> there's a, a shadow you can look at in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says this. It says, And when the Lord thy God shall bring you into the land where you go to possess it. What land is this? It's the promised land, right? And what was it pointing to? Christ. Christ is the land. Christ is the promised land. What does it say in Corinthians? It says, uh, let me have a look at that. In Corinthians, uh, I think it's in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, for all the promises of God is in him. All the promises of God in, in him is yes. And in him, <clears throat> amen, to the glory of God by us. See, so the promises of this promised land is in him. All the promises, the full blown rainbow speaks about the promises of God is in him. It's in God, it's in Christ. He is the, he is the what? He is the substance of it all. So when we go to this passage of scripture here, right? We're looking at laws and principles that's in, it's in me, in my character. So he says, the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land where thou goes to possess it, and has cast out many nations before you. So it's a shadow he's talking about here, but over inside of us, it's characteristics, attitudes, and beliefs. These ites, right? These ites are attitudes. They're beliefs of the character that we have got to overcome that would stop us and speak against this word that you're coming into. That's what it does. So it talks about here that many nations before thee, the, the Hittites, the Gurkhashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Parasites, Hivites, Jubasites. And as I said, every parasite is in there. <laughs> They're all in there. It's a character. 
So when he says that you will overcome, the overcomers will overcome the nations and rule the nations, he's saying that they're going to deal with these ites that are inside of us. It's a parable, but it's all internal. It's not going and overcoming Turkey and Russia and we're going to go out there and do all. Even though that will be a consequence, but the, the, the core of it is the truth that we overcome these ites that are controlling our lives on the inside. And so when we look at this, you know, these attitudes and these ingrained beliefs that have become strongholds in us, whether we grew up and whatever the character is in there, the, the Hittite, right, that character simply means terror. It means fear. So these ites are these nations that are <clears throat> controlling my life. So the Hittite means fear. But you see, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what he's given us. So we're going to know that we're going to overcome this fear. The Gurkhashites speak about darkness is ignorance without understanding. Having a false understanding, it's a blindness and a nakedness concerning the things of God. It's a character, it's a belief and an attitude. Sits inside our character and it speaks against the revelation of God's word. That's what we are contending with. Can I say this? I'm not so much worried about contending with the kings of the earth. I'm going to contend with my own king inside of me. <laughs> king self, king flesh. He's got the biggest mouth inside of me. And he's the one that's saying, don't believe that, don't, oh, we don't feel to do that, don't do it. He's going on forever. But that's the one that this word has to take the head off. That's the true beheading. That's the true full circumcision is when that mind of this beast that's speaking continually is removed. These are its characteristics that sits in me. The seven heads, the seven nations, the seven mountains, it's all here that we've got to deal with. Hittite means terror or fear. Gurkhashite means a lack of understanding. Ephesians 4.18 says, Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. So the darkness that's in our character is contending with the light that's coming in. It doesn't want to be exposed. It's going to put up a whole lot of, you know, a whole lot of things. That's why I'm hearing you know, as we're teaching this word, that there are many ministers of my peers that are rejecting this because something in them doesn't want to sit still and receive revelation when it comes. If you sit in darkness long enough, you believe the darkness. You'll adjust yourself to the way darkness would have you adjust. And you believe what's spoken in the dark by your own character, by your own interpretation of this word. Hmm? Unless God comes in and you submit to him and he removes the understanding of darkness. Gurkhashite, it's an attitude. It's a, it's a belief that's ignorant. Amorites is spiritual pride, publicity, but spiritual pride, haughtiness. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Hmm. Leviathan, you know, we've got a little bit of that DNA of Leviathan in us, which means the king pride. According to Job 41, Job 41, 34, it says that Leviathan is the king of pride. And it sits in us. It's an Amorite. It's an Amorite attitude. Amorite character. It's an ite, and it locks us up. And it has a voice. Because it's a character, it has its own language. It has permission to speak. Because it wants to what? Hide itself so it can control you. If it's exposed, it begins to lose its power. If it stays in the dark, it has more control over you because you don't know it's there. And especially if you're looking outside. Oh, this person's got a problem. Yeah, that pastor, that teacher, this word, that church is all my problems. Everything's outside. Everything outside of you is problems. But it's really inside you. You've got to own it. You've got to own this. You're the one. Let me just say to you here, big mirror here, just shine. See that mirror? Now you can see yourself. And that mirror is talking to you and it's looking on the inside. It's an x-ray vision. You've got to get real and look at yourself. 
you have an Amorite spirit, an attitude in you that controls you, and you've got to give it up. Mm. How do I give up this thing? Humble yourself. Everything I'm saying has a, has a counteract action that you walk in. But I want to tell you, the covenant has been released. And there's a voice with authority that when you walk in this voice, it'll deal with these nations. It'll deal with these ites. Canaanite is a peddler, a trafficker. It misuses the anointing and the revelation that you've received. Right? And it continues on in that way. We can speak more about it, but I just want to say it's a trafficker. Buying and selling. All that stuff comes into this. Parasite. I think this is the last, no, it's not the last one, it's the, I don't know, fifth one. The parasite has no spiritual strength, it's unworldly, it has no defense, it's destitute. In other words, this character says, ah, it's all too hard. I don't really want to get involved in all of this. That's a character. That's a language that's coming up. It's saying, everything's too hard. Everything's too hard. And those sort of people, you know, you've got to carry them, talk to them, feed them, dress them, walk with them, talk to them, pray over them. And they're sitting there constantly with this character that has to be burned and rooted out, not pampered to. That's what we do with a lot of our people. We pamper to the character. Cut the thing out. Burn it. Burn the thing out. So you can be free and you have its, the own character of God in there. You can always spot a person controlled by a parasite spirit because his whole world is on the outside. He has no defenses, no strength, no ability in Christ of his own, but is in total dependent, he's totally dependent upon what others can and others must do for him. If he gets fed, someone else has got to feed him. If he gets dressed, someone else has got to dress him. If he gets bathed, someone's got to throw water over him. He cannot solve any of these problems for himself. They, they must be all ministered to from without. He gets no word from God out of his own spirit. Others teach him, counsel him, prophesy, guide him. They're all over him. That's, a para that's just a parasite. Cut the thing. Burn it. Get it out. And you'll only get free if you accept what God is saying. It may be a character that's dominant in you. All of these seven are in us, but there are some dominant ones that come up more often than the others. Hivite is encampment in the village. It means it's familiar with the systems of the church and the systems of the world. It's, it, it, it's a man-made religious system that works inside. It's a Hivite. It, it, rather, it, it rather gets involved in the system and don't upset it. Right, and there's a lot of things here just one scripture song of songs chapter 1 and verse 6 the woman says do not look upon me because I'm dark because the sun has tanned me she said this and my mother's sons were angry with me they made me the keeper of the vineyard but my own vineyard I have not kept they made, me the, they made me the keeper of the vineyard. In other words, I got more involved in the system of the church and I forgot about my vineyard, which is my relationship with the Lord. Hey, we come to church because we want to connect with God. We must do all those things, but the purpose is to actually get your way to God. But don't get caught up in the system of, any, of anything. Get caught up in Him. It's not about a system, it's about a relationship. And that's where we need to be. Jebusites, threshing place. These attitudes would cause you severe pain, but this threshing place, Matthew 24, 9 says, then they, who are they? The ites will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. They'll separate you from them. They separate the word in you. And you will be hated of all nations. All the ites that are in you will hate you. It's not talking about Turkey, not talking about England or Africa or those, those places will hate you because you come in there with the word. It's talking about hate that is going on and tribulation going on on the inside of you. All these nations will be against you. All these characteristics are against you to try and stop you. But to the overcomer, hallelujah, to the overcomer, I'll give him power over the nations. And he shall rule them with the rod of iron. That means he'll have judgment within this own, his own character. And as the vessels of the potter shall they be broken to, sh 
to shivers, even as I received of my father. In other words, that which is clay in the carnal realm is smashed by a living word that's coming out of the overcomer. Anything that's in these these clay jars that we have stored up. I believe that. I believe this. I believe that. Oh, I love that. I love this. Love. They're all idols. They're all in clay jars. It's all, it's all contained in carnal beliefs. It's going to be broken. And I'll give him the morning star. Morning means resurrection. Star, as we heard, is a messenger, has a message. It's a revelation of resurrection. That'll always be the very heart and soul of an overcomer. He'll walk in resurrection and new life. He'll have a word that speaks revelation. There's nothing else that he'll say, but he'll speak out of himself, out of resurrection and new life. The morning star. We can say more on that. I can go to more scriptures on that. But just this morning, you know, just to refresh ourselves to the overcomer. Talking about that area there. The core of the soul is going to be dealt with by the right hand. It's the blood speaking of the covenant specific to deal with this area in the church to the overcomer. All right? Then she is able to be washed. Church of Sardis to the overcomer. Verse 5. That's Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5 talking about the church of Sardis. To the overcomer, he says, he shall be clothed in white raiment. There it is, white raiment. What's white raiment? Transparent character. Invisible character. Oh, precious Lord. You know, to the Son, when we get home to be with the Lord, there'll be other Christians that will be in heaven, but they won't be part of sonship, which is up in the invisible realm. When you come out of that invisible realm, you can choose whether you want to reveal yourself in the third dimension, in the second or the first, but you can see all three at any one time, but they can't see you if you choose them not to, if you choose not to. If you want to walk invisible, you walk invisible, but there's something in us that's given the right to be and see all dimensions. That's this garment, clothed in white, it's invisible. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I will not blot out his name, it says there, out of the book of life. See, flip that. Flip it around. That's saying also that everyone's name is in there to start with, but there are those that don't go on to sonship will be blotted out. They will be taken out of the inheritance. They will be taken... The, the inheritance that was in them will be removed. But those that press on and become overcomers, their name will not be removed. Their name is inscribed in the book. What book? A character. It's not a physical book. It's a character called Christ. The book of life is a character. It's a person. Right? It's God himself. This book of Sardis. See, when you read Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 5, just over in chapter 5, he says, and I saw in his right hand of him that sat on the throne. Right, what hand was it? The right hand. Revelation 5. I saw in his right hand of him that sat on the throne. What? A book. Right? A book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Right? And then he said, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals? And no man in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. I wept because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book that was there. Verse 5 says, but one of the elders said to me, don't weep. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah, mm, the root of David. He has prevailed to open the book to loose the seven seals. What? To open what book? To open himself. Hallelujah. How did he open himself? He bled. Oh, glory. When they cut him and they bruised him and they, put, they, they pierced him, the book was being opened for all to read. And you can read the revelation that was coming because of the blood. Oh, hallelujah. Because it came out. This was the book that was open. He was prevailed. The tribe, the, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. Verse 9, and they sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou was what? Slain. And you have redeemed us to God by thy blood. <laughs> out of every kindred tongue of people and nations and has made us 
unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall rule and reign on this earth, or we shall reign on the earth. See, the book is a person, it's Jesus. When he bled, it opened up, and he opened up all the seals. All the revelation was now given to us, but it's very specific, and we've got to understand to walk in it, and walk in the purposes of it. That's to the overcomer. What does it say? And we clothe, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. That says you can be blotted out, but these overcomers weren't blotted out. I will confess his name before my father. Those who have this understanding and walking in it, right? It then gives us the credentials to come into his presence. It's not that Jesus is up there saying, you know, uh, this is Brian Lampton, uh, father. Um, <clears throat> he's got the blood on him and he's wearing it here. He's coming in. Come in, Brian, come in. I just want to say, I confess you before my... It's not like that. Once you've got this understanding, it's loud in the spirit world. It's an announcement in the spirit world that when you come before him, it's your coronation. The manifestation of the sons of God is your personal coronation. It's your declaration that it's coming out of the character. This man is speaking the blood. It's coming off you. You never opened your mouth. It's coming off the character. That's the confession. Because it's in the covenant. And whoever walks in the covenant is credentialed to be a son. And I thank God for that. So the church of Philadelphia, we're coming to the end of our message this morning, a little bit here. The church of Philadelphia, verse 12 of chapter 3. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar that means it will be established. Established right in God and he shall go no more out he won't go out anymore well, what does that mean he won't go out anymore well according to the priests back in the time of Moses when they would do all the priestly things and they do it the next day they keep doing it after many years they get old and then it comes to a point where they are too old to do what the priests are to do they take off the garments and they put it on the young one they trained and now they take it on but the old priest walks out he's got to go out because he can't continue why because death has got him death and age has got him he's got to go out of the temple and let someone else serve but this overcomer in this feast in this tabernacle in this temple will never go out he lives forever. He's overcome death. He's got on a garment. It's inside of him, not on him, in him. This character speaks priestly words and he is serving the living God, his father. He never has to leave himself. He doesn't leave himself. He's the temple of God. And God dwells in him and he doesn't have to go anywhere. It's just a picture of the reality of this character that's within. He says, we'll go out no more and I'll write upon him a new name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is the new Jerusalem which has come down out of heaven from my God listen to this I will write on him a new name of my God and then he says about Jerusalem which is new Jerusalem the bride so the new name was this area of this new name here the character of the mind of Christ is now in there and the new Jerusalem is the character of the bride so he's saying you're part and one with everything you have this character and you also have the bride we're one with it oh hallelujah this is all in God it's a character so he who has ears to hear let him hear what the spirit says the last church is the church of Laodicea verse 21 says to him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne so that speaks there very specifically about the man child who will be caught up to God and to his throne. That's the man child. Well, Pastor Brian, what is the man child? Well, in short, in very simple form, right? When the marriage takes place, you have this character of love and humility come, which is the bridegroom, and then she is now washed, which is the law of submission. So you have the character of submission becoming one with the character of humility and love, and it gives birth to the seed, the seed of obedience, which is the man child. It's a character that is approved of God. It's caught up to God and to his throne. Caught to God for approval and then takes on this character to rule and reign with Christ 
It's a character sitting inside of us. We have the bridegroom, the law and character of the bridegroom, the law of the wife is marriage there, and this character that will always rule and reign and speak on God's behalf. It's a character that's inside of us. Only given to sons. They have the man-child character. They become the Ark of the Covenant. It's inside by law of character, and they are able to speak. That's to the overcomer. So the right hand speaks a word that cleans out the man of sin, cleanses her, and he becomes the overcomer because of the power of that word. I know in my heart that God wants to deal with the Jebu all the, all the ites, and he wants to deal with everything to bring us into this freedom that's in him. He wants you to be part of him in the invisible realm that's in God. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. And we just ask, oh God, that as this is only a seed word that can create in us, Lord, understanding to walk in, we desire to be an overcomer ourselves, to, to defeat those things that we are challenged with. But Lord, your word promises us, we know we can't do it, but it's your word that lifts us, give us revelation. And as we practice and obey what you show us, we will be clothed with that. And we'll walk through the straight gate, the narrow way, and on our way back home. So, Father, we thank you for your instructions. Speak unto us as we submit to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And I'll catch you again soon. Amen. Amen.